in the fall of 2015, we established an MIT Climate Resiliency Committee, and it was launched to coordinate faculty and staff in an effort to join forces around a shared desire to prepare MIT for the impacts of climate change and utilize our, MI, our own MIT resources and research um, to harness new, to, to basically inform us and to harness new thinking um, for both local and regional preparation. So it's a, a fabulous opportunity given the resources that we have in house. So when we speak about climate resiliency, we mean the ability to prepare for and respond to and prevent disruption from climate impacts. Um, I think what you'll hear today is an expansion upon that definition of resiliency really to include the more human elements, for instance, adding the ability for people to thrive even in uncertain conditions. So I think we'll, we'll hear about that both in the panel and in the workshop this afternoon. So our panelists today will be touching particularly on, on this human element, but providing an uh, overview. But what I challenge all of you and uh, moving forward is we really need to, we all, and what you'll hear today, is define resiliency still a little bit differently, which is, which is fine. That's the engagement within higher education. And I think what we're looking for over the next year is to make sure that we're at least speaking a common language around that and common, common uh, elements. Um, so today we'll open up that discussion to all of you to help inform us. The charge of the Resiliency Committee uh, was to complete a campus climate vulnerability assessment to basically assess the impacts of climate change in five key areas. So increasing temperatures, extreme storms, flooding, uh, storm surges, sea level rise, those are the five, and then of course the interaction of these factors. And again, we're so fortunate to have the researchers in-house who have these, the modeling cap capabilities to do that, and at various time intervals. So for example, we must anticipate or see, for instance, you know, when there's extreme hurricanes in the future where sea level rises, uh, rise have already taken place, what are those impacts going to be? So you may recall from last year's, for those of you who were with us last year, we had a panel that incorporated um, the city of Cambridge and they released their own climate vulnerability assessment. And so this map comes out of their assessment. So the key piece here, let me see if it's got, is that, and I'm gonna step away from the mic for a moment, when you look at it, is you'll notice, wow, MIT is all set. No, you know, it looks like, wow, just the part, Cambridge is gonna be flooded in areas, but not MIT, and that was because the, the, um, the vulnerability assessment didn't cover all of our, our own campus. So now what we've been able to do, um, so you were misinformed <laughs> if you thought we were all set. But anyway, the beauty of that is because of the relationship we have with the city of Cambridge and because climate vulnerability has no boundaries. The researchers from MIT have now been able to take those, um, the, the initial studies and now build upon the, that mapping to now understand what the interaction is or how, how, does this, how do these impacts continue. And again, the faculty I think will speak to this more broadly. So we're identifying opportunities for research and living lab projects to improve both, to think through and inform our own assessment and vulnerability where our vulnerability lies, to play a leadership role in convening re regional partnerships for shared planning. Again, these are already taking off. And then continue to integrate climate vulnerability assessment into the outcomes both with the city of Cambridge and Boston and our own campus planning. With that, I'd like to introduce, uh, I'm gonna start, we've got three panelists. We have Brent Ryan, we have uh, Marion Kirkbride, and Larry Suskind. We're gonna invite Brent up to start in just a moment. Brent is an associate um, professor of urban design and public policy and head of the city design and development group. Brent focuses on contemporary urban design, particularly in post-industrial cities. So Brent, thank you so much for joining us. Um, the, the floor is yours. Thank you, Jill. Uh, I've been asked to speak for about seven minutes on a study that I'm currently engaged in with a colleague, uh, Christopher Zegris, also in the Urban uh, Studies and Planning Department. Um, you, you may be able to tell from my title, I'm not a sustainability or climate change scholar. I actually study urban form. But the fact is, if so, uh, some sea level rise predictions or projections are accurate, then we're gonna to have to do a lot of thinking about urban form as well, in particular thinking about human settlement in coastal areas and where people might live if the coast as it currently is configured, which we know is somewhat temporary, um, becomes uninhabitable. So this is a pilot study. 
Uh, we'll be wrapping up uh, probably in June or July. So I'm, these aren't the complete findings of our study. They're really just preliminary. But I just want to show you a couple of the considerations that we're taking, uh, taking in as we carry out this study. So we're looking at a certain uh, projection of sea level rise, a maximum perhaps of six feet of sea level rise by 2100. Of course, all of these figures are arguable. The point of our study was not to engage in the climate science to determine whether or not six feet was a true figure, but to take what was regarded as a relatively reputable figure and just accept it as a given and say, if this is true, what are the effects going to be on the Massachusetts coast, which of course includes MIT as part of the region of Boston. And so our calculations show, just looking at residential areas alone, um, over 300,000 people would potentially be displaced if you're looking at current population figures and if you're looking at homes whose ground levels would be at or below sea level by 2100 given this figure. So some of the questions that we're asking, um, we want to look at all of the towns in Massachusetts and look at particularly how they're proportionally um, going to be impacted because as you know Massachusetts is politically fragmented. You have some very small towns that are uh, highly victimized by potential sea level rise. And we want to look at the reality of relocation, politically challenging as it may seem. We want to see if land was required, where would people move, assuming that those 300,000 people wouldn't simply go away, but might choose to remain in the region. Um, as urban planners and designers, we want to think about settlement strategies. And in a sense, this is the mitigation part of our um, study. A lot of our region is settled with auto-dependent sprawling patterns. Would we settle in a, in a denser, more sustainable way? Um, and my colleague is looking at the transportation impact, in particular at the region's infrastructure, so I won't be presenting that. And then uh, in the end, we'll be thinking about how this might possibly be implemented. Of course, that's very challenging in our current uh, political system. So some of the figures that we uh, generate show that some towns will be um, highly impacted by sea level rise with up to 50% of their um, population impacted. Towns like the city of Hull, um, Salisbury on the North Shore. Uh, this is a very coastal condition, but of course cities in the Boston region, Cambridge, Boston, et cetera, um, will have maybe uh, up to 20 or 30% of their population impacted. And if you total up all of these numbers, it adds up to the 300,000 that I mentioned earlier. What we're doing um, right now is engaging in a land inventory because we're thinking about where um, land would be available if there was in fact less land for people to be living. Uh, the reality is that uh, we're likely to look at a scenario where public land or otherwise open land would be seen as a kind of low-hanging fruit in which people would relocate. If you think of a piece of land like the Blue Hills Reservation, um, historically, this, this land has been thought of as a reservoir for hospitals, school facilities, et cetera. Um, this public land, which you can see uh, in green here, I'm not sure if it shows up on the screen, but uh, it does on my uh, drawing. Um, this would be the lowest hanging fruit. Of course, most of the land in the region is privately owned, but a lot of it's very low density. So we're also looking at land where um, below a certain percentage of that land is actually uh, occupied. And my, my final slide, I just want to talk about the relocation principles that we're investigating. And this is how we'll be deciding how to project future settlement patterns. Um, first, we want to think of moving people out of harm's way. In other words, we don't want to move someone from two feet above sea level to only seven feet above sea level. We want to move someone to an elevation where they're not potentially going to be victimized by flood events in 2100. Of course, if we think of the worst case scenarios for sea level rise, all of these will be moot because we'd be looking at potentially hundreds of feet of sea level rise. So we're, we're not taking those worst cases into scenario. We're examining the idea of receiving capacity. In other words, which places would have land. But the irony is that a lot of places that have land, like the town of Hingham, for example, most of this land is conservation land. Hingham is actually adjacent to Hull, which is a very densely settled town that's going to be very highly victimized by sea level rise. So we're looking at this principle of inland towns serving as receptacles for population for densely settled coastal towns. Uh, building, it back, be building it back better, this is our mitigation strategy. Building in proximity to transit, building more densely. And then thinking of the feasibility of implementation using publicly owned or nonprofit owned land versus actually the idea of using privately owned land and some kind of subdivision of privately owned land. 
Uh, the last principle, and this is also playing a big factor, and we're looking at a lot of literature relating to past traumatic events like urban renewal that happened in Boston in the 1950s, is minimizing the idea of stress. If we think of the emotional impact of having to move from where you lived, like with what happened with New Orleans in Hurricane Katrina, we're looking at minimizing stress factors by thinking that people might want to live, perhaps, near where they lived before so that maybe they could go back part-time or at least go back to visit where they used to live even if they can't live there full-time. In other words, we're thinking about the proximity to the sending site as we determined it. Um, in the future, we'll actually be looking at three case studies. One where we're looking at relocation within an existing town's boundary. Uh, one, we're, we're looking at relocation from one town to another. And the third, which is probably the most difficult to imagine implementing, is actually constructing a wholly new large-scale settlement that might number in the tens or even hundreds of thousands of people on a place like a large reservoir of publicly available land. And again, uh, together with my colleague who's looking at the transportation impacts, we'll be completing our findings this summer, and then we'll be looking at some sort of publication venue following the conclusion. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Brent. So the next speaker is, is our very own Marion Kirkbride, I believe. You're going to come on up. And she's the clinical director for Campus Life. And in her role, Marion acts as the liaison between MIT Medical and the larger MIT community. There she is. To improve the health and wellness of the community at MIT. And come on up. And I think the opportunity here is to demonstrate as we really grapple with the role of how we're going to define resiliency, is that we have multiple perspectives within the community. And we have the role of research, which you'll hear kind of on the bookends, and then the role that the Mind Hand Heart Initiative is playing in really defining the human component of that. So welcome and thank you. Thanks so much, everybody. Wow. Um, I didn't really mean to make an eye chart, but apparently I did, so I will explain as we go on. Um, it's really great to be able to um, share with you um, some of the things we've been doing on the human side of resilience and um, uh, to think about both what should we be considering uh, in terms of building beyond kind of uh, infrastructure and uh, resilient buildings and how do we think about measures for human wellness, for thriving communities as we do some of these things. I mean, building on the idea of stress of having to move, um, and I think some of Tony's ideas of using our data transparently to help shape behavior, those are things that we're very interested in. So this morning I wanted to tell you a little bit about the Mind Hand Heart Initiative and then think with you about um, how do we define resilience more in human terms, what we can do together, and how will we measure. Mind Hand Heart was started last fall. Uh, it's a, it is co-sponsored by the Chancellor's Office and MIT Medical. We have a faculty chair, Roz Picard, from the Media Lab. Uh, the goal of it is to enhance mental health and overall well-being at MIT. And while it's currently focused on serving students, we are designed to welcome uh, serving all community members uh, as we move forward uh, into the future. I think uh, people here will resonate with our structure. So, so far we have in our first year a steering committee and a series of six working groups and an innovation fund, kind of an MIT approach to solving almost any big problem. Um, and those groups have faculty and staff and students working together along with some campus experts to achieve our overall goal. And that is that over time, Mind, Hand, Heart will help members of our community feel more comfortable asking for help when we need it, build a healthier, stronger, and more welcoming community, and ensure that MIT is eliciting our best while giving us the tools to be our best. And I will say parenthetically that in talking with students, without question and without exception, Please do not take away our rigor. This is why we are here. Don't lighten this up. We want to provide better tools, but uh, students are really here at MIT for that reason, and I think we all are too. Our program is built in national best practices, and that's what this slide describes. Um, we are working with the Jed Foundation. It's a nonprofit that has been studying suicide prevention and improving mental well being on college campuses for over a decade. There, uh, in turn, they have built their program on research from the Air Force, 
where over a period of about 10 years, the Air Force decreased their suicide rate by about a third. And they did it uh, by building community preventive strategies, not unlike what is happening uh, in thinking about community uh, resilience on the uh, sustainability end. So the framework has nine campus elements, and I'll read them to you. This is the eye chart part. Uh, so one is about policy and strategy. That is really, in, in our uh, year this year, has really been focusing on leaves and withdrawals, uh, something the chancellor has and our faculty have taken up. Developing life skills, and that's where resiliency lives in our program, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. Uh, connectedness, preventing loneliness. I think we, uh, that is something that affects all members of our community also. Um, academic performance, uh, the JED uh, group is sort of light on academic performance compared to MIT, and we have renamed this the academic environment, and there's quite a bit of work going on in terms of uh, thinking about how we determine uh, how to best support our students within our rigorous curriculum. Student wellness, identifying students at risk, increasing help-seeking behavior, uh, providing mental health and substance abuse services. This is really the only clinical part of this entire framework. Uh, means restriction and environmental safety, and that it does include some overlap here. We're thinking about roofs. Um, in some campuses, they're thinking about guns, et cetera. Uh, so that is where we are. We're working for a resilient campus community. I would like to um, advance the slide. How do I do that? There we go. Uh, talk a little bit about what's our definition of resiliency, what can we do, and how do we measure success. So uh, the life skills group had a daunting challenge in that uh, resiliency, I think you might relate to this, lives everywhere, is owned by no one, and impacts everything. So they have been looking at best practices, figuring out our strengths and weaknesses, and are working on a model that we can all kind of hold on to. Uh, but the definition that they're using, which I think also will resonate, is that it's the ability to bounce back from negative events using positive emotions, thoughts, and behaviors. And within the work of the committee, they're going to specifically focus on assisting with student growth and development. Uh, what can we do? I will uh, offer four areas for us to think about now and in the future. The first is sort of a no-brainer, and that's our built environment. We will have opportunities in the coming years to think about our residential communities. But also, um, within Mind, Hand, Heart and our innovation fund this year, there's been kind of a clamoring for environmental change. Can we have walls that are completely made of plants Thank you, Norm Magnuson, for working with those people. Uh, can we use uh, community gardening and residences to build community? Uh, can we um, welcome our outdoor spaces, make them more welcoming with places for people to sit? These things are just coming up from our community into the Innovation Fund, and I think are really resonating with uh, things that people are doing together. Raising awareness and providing insight. So we focus on mind and hand. We focus heavily on achievement. achievement all the way around. And in the meantime, what do we know? We know that our well-being significantly impacts our achievement. So Mind and Heart is trying to help raise that awareness and make that connection. And I would say that people in this room are interested in extending that connection. So the, uh, the well-being of our environment, how we impact it and how it impacts us, is equally as important as our own mindfulness and our own attention to our own well-being. So there's a conversation to be had about sharing those values. So in addition to our built environment, and raising awareness, we need to think about how we intentionally build community. And I was happy for Julie to put up the definition of campus resiliency because what did I do when I had this assignment? I Googled campus resilience, you know, community resilience. And so a couple of phrases really stuck out for me that were very much aligned with this effort, and that is strengthening trusted community networks. That's what we need to do in terms of what Tony was saying about changing our behavior. Um, as a group, collaborative planning processes that are participatory, and there were so many references to whole community approaches. And lastly, evolving cultural norms and practices. If we do these three things right, we will help shape our culture moving into the future. So how will we measure? I think also in an analog to what Julie and her team has faced, we have decentralized bits of uh, data and information all over our campus that impact how our students and our staff and our faculty uh, feel resilient and can strengthen our resiliency. So part of the job of Mind, Hand, Heart is to bring all that together and figure out what it means and how do we take best advantage of it. Right now, in terms of um, evaluation, 
We use a flourishing scale for students, so that measures self-esteem, purpose, uh, purpose, optimism, and relationships. And I can tell you that our students score about 10 percentage points lower than our national average, and that's something that we're thinking about and concerned with. Um, and lastly, uh, I think another analog, we have the opportunity to redesign what we do, how we measure, um, and I think we will use our, I see Lydia out here, use our survey data in new ways, but also think beyond survey data. And the example that I use is, in my past life, I worked in urban communities, and um, we could tell working in a community if there were window boxes, that there was also community networks, that people talked to each other, and that people were interested in making their neighborhood better. And I'm looking for our window boxes. How do we find them together? Uh, so in summary, I would say that we are uh, being resilient now and in the future to support strong and connected individuals and communities, poised and prepared to adapt, evolve, and thrive in the face of challenge. Thanks very much. Thank you so much, Marian. Our final speaker is Larry Suskind. He's a professor in the Department of Urban Studies and Planning and director of the MIT Science Impact Collaborative and the MIT UTM Malaysia Sustainable Cities Program and co-director of the Water Diplomacy Workshop. So Larry, thank you so much for joining us this year. Yeah. Thanks very much. I'm pleased to be part of the conversation today. Uh, you heard a little bit about the city of Cambridge's vulnerability assessment. They spent a lot of time and money producing this vulnerability assessment. Imagine that your task was to produce a downscaled risk assessment using three variables, basically, temperature, sea level, and precipitation. And you got to do a near-term, a mid-term, and a long-term forecast. And you got to put a high, medium, and low estimate there. Uh, and that's what the city has produced with a lot of help. Um, if you read it all, what it says is that there's going to be water in the wrong places at the wrong time and a lot more hot days. And so then the question is, what should the city do? That water is going to take the form of serious flooding. You saw one version of that map. We know there's going to be increasing storm intensity. And we know there's going to be an increasing number of hot days in a row in the summer. In, um, sorry, didn't mean to do that. Want to turn that off, Steve, for me? Because I don't need it. In East Cambridge, the water's coming over from the river. In the Alewife part of Cambridge, the water's coming up through the drainage systems. If you live there, you know what I'm talking about. And um, the question is, what should the city do now? What should it do now? There's flooding now. It's just going to get worse. If you know there's going to be a lot of hot days in a row, then you can anticipate that people with certain kind of health problems who are not mobile and who don't have air conditioning are going to be going to the hospital. What do you do about preparedness? If you know you're going to have increased storm intensity, that you know you're going to have no energy for periods of time, which is going to restrict mobility and food delivery and waste disposal and water delivery, what do you do? Our team at the Science Impact Collaborative in the Department of Urban Studies and Planning is trying to translate these different forecasts of risk into specific health risks, public health risks. It's linked to what Marian was talking about. But our focus is on the whole community of Cambridge and what are the likely public health risks associated with that flooding with that loss of power, with that problem of extended heat waves, the so-called heat island effect. And we've been trying to help sort through possible actions that the city could take in the face of those different risks, now, near term, long term, given different likelihoods. 
We've done this with other coastal communities in New England. You can read about that in our book called Managing Climate Risks in Coastal Communities, published by Anthem in 2015. Or you can look at localclimatechange.mit.edu and see more about what happens when you hand those forecasts, those risk assessments, to a whole community. And now we're trying to see what happens when you hand those forecasts to a whole city and show the transforms from those kinds of changes to public health risks. We started to work with different groups in the city. And based on our preliminary interactions with all kinds of workshops around the city, there are three points I want to make. The first is that MIT cannot plan for climate change on its own. And you saw in the first diagram, there's individuals and in campus and city and world. Um, I'm not sure I would put the arrows quite that way. I think we should be working with the city of Cambridge. And then based on what we help them do, it has some impact back, back on what the campus can and should do, as opposed to the campus figuring out what it wants to do and sharing that and staying in touch with the city of Cambridge. There's only so much storm proofing and emergency preparedness MIT can do on its own. Most of the relevant adaptation work that needs to be done must be citywide or area-wide. We should be integral now to those activities. And I know that Julie's office is trying to do that. I think the whole community, students in residence halls that are gonna be affected, faculty who live in Cambridge, all of those groups, we need to be part of what Cambridge is doing if we really wanna do sustainability planning, particularly adaptation. Second, I think it's important to translate climate risks into public health risks if you wanna motivate people. And in all of our workshops with different groups in the city, as soon as you start talking about climate change, people think that's a long-term effect on a lot of other people, and I got too many things to worry about now to be putting time, energy, and money against that. If you show people what the health risks are now of flooding, of urban heat island effects, they want to know what they can do about it right now. They want to know what the city's going to do to protect them. And so all of us who started working on climate change by focusing on mitigation, as far as I'm concerned, should be switching to a focus on adaptation, particularly in terms of health risk, because it changes entirely your ability to engage people in a discussion. Third, adaptation is primarily a collaborative decision-making problem. It's not a scientific or an engineering problem. It is a collaborative decision-making problem. The things that you saw Brent talking about, those decisions can't be made by individuals to move a city or move a lot of people or adopt regulations that say you're gonna be displaced. These are collective decision problems. Unless there's agreement, no action is likely to be taken, even though everyone says some action should be taken. Join us after lunch in playing a game. This is the same role play simulation that we're taking out working with um, churches and synagogues and mosques in the city, working with high tech groups, working with business groups. It is absolutely crucial that we work with separate groups so people can begin to see for their group what kinds of concerns they uh, are facing. The game asks you in one hour to play a role of one of six groups in a city a lot like Cambridge, but that isn't Cambridge, so you're not burdened by all your extra knowledge that you have. And you have one hour to make a series of choices about managing climate risks in this city, particularly in light of the public health effects that the climate risk poses. The real numbers and everything for Cambridge are worked into the game. And in one hour, you have to make some decisions. We're gonna collect the actual results here and we're gonna write those up and we're gonna include those in the summaries of the results of working with all the other groups and we'll be presenting those to the city council in the fall because they have to make some choices and they're trying to learn what different kinds of groups are thinking. So I have a hunch there's a distinct MIT perspective on climate adaptation. Come and help us figure out 
what it is. We're glad to share it with you as soon as we tally what happens in the results of the game this afternoon. Uh, thanks for letting us include the game in the event. Thank you. All right, let's open it up to some questions from all of you. Hi, I'm Lisa Anderson. I'm a postdoc in chemical engineering. Uh, my question um, is, I guess, more for Brent. Uh, and if your relocation studies um, considered access to food and water, uh, and if you also think about relocation to outer space. <laughs> Obviously, the relocation question is very complex, and there's questions also of where work relocates to. Um, or of how you get from home to work and back and forth. Um, among our relocation variables, the build it back better variable implies that there's better access to the basket of goods that are needed, but we haven't identified or isolated food in particular as a variable. But as it's a pilot study, of course, the ground is open, so to speak, for that to happen. No, we're not looking at, we're, we're not looking at, um, was outer space a facetious? It wasn't facetious. Um, we're, we're operating in a spirit of optimism, saying that um, adaptation is completely possible, even if the seemingly apocalyptic scenario of homes and workplaces being lost actually occurs. But we're assuming that people, the Boston region will remain, even with uh, a few feet of sea level rise, and that people would continue to want to locate here and uh, live and act you know, in, a, in a very normal way. And this has proven to be the case with a lot of uh, disasters that have occurred. People want to rec uh, return to a normal life as soon as possible. So we're trying to operate with a situation normal or as normal as can be um, in, this, in this pilot study. I mean, just to add, um, you had the town of Hull as your first farthest left upper candidate. Town of Hull is inundated constantly. I don't know if anybody lives in Hull, but uh, it's flat and it's at sea level and it's on the coast. Guess what? And it is constantly destroyed and everybody goes right back. And they have passed bylaws recently that said it, when you rebuild, you've got to have a knockout panel on the first floor so that water can flow through and you don't have anything below a level that is higher than what you're at now. So the notion of knockout panels, design standards, rebuild in a better way, but stay where you are, is what the current focus has been. But how many times and how badly will Hull need to be inundated before someone says, uh, do I have to leave Massachusetts? Gee, my family's here. Where's my place to go? Everyone considers that an individual choice now. I think what Brent's suggesting is maybe there are collective choices through public policy that are options that are often to people, not requirements. My follow-up question for particularly the two of you is we have a lot of decision makers in this room and if, if you could provide some you know, advice or you know, words of in the phase that we're all in is how do we begin to take the data that is being collected um, from both of you from various angles and really begin to think through, and this influences your work very much, right? Uh, how we, you know, how we think about stormwater and land management and our built environment um, moving into the future. I would just say one thing, which is that the evidence shows that the small municipalities that are victimized today by flooding and in the future are likely to be victimized by sea level rise. It's absolutely beyond the political capacity of these small places that may have as few as just a few thousand people or even just 10,000 people to deal with the full implications of the problem of climate change. And this is the evidence from New Jersey and other places that are experiencing this kind of flooding. Towns don't have it in their budgets to even build the, um, the seawall measures that they would need to stop the flooding that's happening now. So I think the kind of collective decision making that Larry mentioned is going to happen at a going to need to happen on a very radical level and probably at a regional level. And we can um, beat our heads against the wall right now saying we don't have these regional institutions in place, but they will have to exist in order for this decision making to happen beyond the scale of these small towns. I, my sense is that there are three 
I don't want to call them stages because they won't go so neatly, but th three things you've got to worry about when you want to engage people in climate change conversations and climate risk management conversations at any level, in a building on the campus, in a dorm, or at every scale going up. The first has to do with the salience of the issue. You've got to figure out a way to present the issue so that it has some meaning to people, not just altru as altruistic folks worried about others in the future, but as it affects them and the people they care most about. So if you haven't figured out how to present your issue in a way that get, gains salience, nothing else is going to happen. And then once you have people's attention and the issue's gone up, the issue attention cycle to a higher level and you've achieved salience, then the next issue is readiness. If people don't feel competent to look at the risk and think about ways of responding to the risk and understand the relative costs and benefits of the different ways of responding, they'll be frozen. It's salient, I'm upset, and there's nothing I can do and I feel powerless. And even though I'm being asked, I don't go, I don't talk, I don't speak because I don't feel competent enough. And we figured out with the use of games which you'll see this afternoon, that we can share a huge amount of technical information with people painlessly, really quickly, that gives them a sense of readiness to participate in the third thing, which is trying to make decisions that have legitimacy. Salience, readiness, legitimacy. What would make a collective decision legitimate in the eyes of one of those communities? Something that comes from a technical advisor from outside the place that has been sold to the leadership that presents it to the public no matter how elegantly, no matter how many times, not going to be viewed as legitimate. There has to be direct engagement. There has to be a face-to-face -face conversation about the conflicts in the distribution of gains and losses to different groups. There has to be transparency. There has to be a willingness to make an approximation, monitor, and adjust, and commit to doing that together. Salience, readiness, legitimacy. I think that applies at any of the scales that any of us are working. Following up on the last uh, comment about we need a larger scale decision, I mean, I've heard in a number of these presentations by Cambridge that, at least for Cambridge uh, and some of the this side of the river stuff and probably some on the other side, if we shore up this dam down here in, in a significant way, which w is a legitimate state action, I, I would assume, you know, at least the flooding part could go away. The, the hot weather part we can't deal with uh, that way, but, but some of these decisions they seem reasonably solvable from, from the point of view of our community. Now, those South Shore communities were right on the water. I don't know what we do. But, but I don't know. I guess I'm, I'd like a reaction to why. I mean, that's not a hard technical sell, is it? I mean, I guess there's a lot of money involved, but it's just money. I, I would just say that we made our study regional and focused because we felt that a lot of the climate change, sea level change studies had focused on the center city where presumably uh, the concentration of capital investments are so high that some type of barrier situation, and I, we have not investigated barrier possibilities, but some type of barrier is obviously a possibility and even perhaps a likelihood with very, very high levels of capital investment e.g. Manhattan, e.g. Center City, Boston, Cambridge, et cetera. We decided to look at a broader scale because we know that that's not going to be possible in every place. In fact, in the great majority of human settlements, that's not going to be possible because the levels of capital investment aren't high enough to merit that kind of barrier type situation. So we purposely broadened the study to say, for the average coastal dweller in Massachusetts, the barrier is not a realistic possibility. But of course, for center cities, the situation is very different, and I'm sure there are going to be a battery of additional studies to investigate that should the risks increase. Um, very quickly, uh, from the, for the whole of the western part of Cambridge, the problem isn't the same as it is for East Cambridge in terms of what intense storms or flooding is going to create. Flooding coming up versus flooding coming over is really different. So you're going to have a question about, well, there's, we have some ideas that have already been putting in motion uh, in west part of Cambridge. They're expensive to try to deal with storm 
sep separating the, the storm sewers and the dealing with overflow and dealing with drainage problems. Should the money that is available go into that or raising the dam over here? How high should it be raised? Who gains, who loses? Who's going to manage that? What do you lose by raising it, if there's anything? And then what about all the water that's coming in across the river from a, a sufficient storm surge on the other side? There are climate modelers in the room who can talk about this better than I can. It turns out that anything that looks obvious for one piece of the problem, and may well, you may be able to model it and show it's correct, does involve cost trade-offs with other things for other people in the same community, especially if it's regional, and we have no forum yet for presenting the distribution of gains and losses relative to the different risks to the different communities in a moment when the communities feel competent to participate. So that may well be that there are infrastructure improvements, but we need to get to the point where we don't just do them one at a time, that we enumerate them in the face of shared information about risk, and we have people representing different groups who are willing to do the homework to be ready to participate, and that we find a way to make these decisions collectively so that they're legitimate. So I, I don't challenge for a minute that if I lived in East Arlington, I'd want the height of the dam increased. But is that going to do everything I need? Or is there other water coming from the Mystic? And is other water coming from the Charles? And is that going to affect drainage issues for me in East Cambridge? And maybe when I saw all the choices and their costs and benefits and who pays for which of them, then I would be clearer about how to respond. In the talks that you guys all gave, I heard a couple of different um, objective functions. Um, w one that was about sort of mitigation and reducing our carbon footprint. Um, one that was about resiliency to the physical changes in the uh, physical environment. And the third was about flourishing um, in terms of individuals' um, sort of well-being. Um, so those are sort of three different framings about what we're doing here. And I'm just wondering, um, are there particular solutions or particular actions or strategies that, you get, that you're excited about because they sort of hit all three um, in a way. Um, or how to, you know, and any other comments about squaring those, those three objectives? The thing that was particularly exciting to me about um, participating today is that um, we are very interested in improving access for parts of our academic community to work closely with our staff, much more closely. And truthfully, this is a fantastic model for Mind, Hand, Heart, where faculty, students, and staff are really strengthening those community ties that when push comes to shove and we have to make um, tough decisions, we're going to have a much more trusting community network to build from. So I think that cuts across all three of the things that we were talking about and something that is um, uh, at least for me, uh, a pillar of, on which I'm trying to build our uh, the Mind, Hand, Heart initiative, and just as a citizen of the community, something I look forward to taking advantage of. And while I have the microphone, I would like to say that I participated in this game over the winter time, uh, and I had a fantastic time, and it is as advertised. I am not an expert in anything related to climate change, and I learned a lot of things um, in a hurry and had a great time, so it was great. Thank you. So um, one more minute if, each, and then we're going to wrap up. If, if you overlaid the three uh, ob objective functions you described, I'm not sure you know, how I do the math, but I have a hunch that a focus on preparedness actually helps you move on all three fronts at every scale. If you get people into the mood of not just responding to the last disaster, but actually trying to think hard about what are no regrets moves that we can take now since we're going to be spending money and maintaining and enhancing our infrastructure. We're going to be organizing our health delivery system, our emergency response system, our information management systems. We're going to be doing those. Which ones put, which moves? when looked at in terms of those different objectives, put us in the best position, given the uncertainty that we're trying to cope with. Uh, so very briefly, the adaptation principles, my concluding slide, that's essentially a construct. We 
developed those and kind of sewed those together. Literature demonstrates the validity of different areas of those, but together it's a, it's a construct. And our instinct was that should adaptation be necessary by having to move, that mitigation and also mental health are both part of that equation. So um, having to move in an unplanned, unpredictable, disruptive way is very disruptive to people's mental health. And we see what happened with Hurricane Katrina where it's essentially a random scatter function. If you dropped a pile of pebbles on a point and you saw where they scattered, that's where people ended up. It was totally undesigned. So we're saying we can do much better than that and we can rebuild in a way that ideally mitigates continued sea level change should that be the case. Thank you so much. So the intention of having this panel was to begin to really open this up, this complex challenge up to us as a community. So what I invite all of you to do is use today as an opportunity to take note of this. And we recognize, and I think this was emphasized today, uncertainty kept coming up as one of the key terms used here, the role of the human dimension component, the role of risk. So we realize when you go back to your, you know, when you, when you, re go back to your uh, decision-making world, it's really difficult to figure out how do, you, how do you absorb this and how do you bring this in. So what we do is invite you into, let's make sure the, um, we'll come up with a way to make sure that the Climate Vulnerability uh, Resiliency Committee reports out to all of you, and then we'll need feedback from you. We'll ensure that we have feedback loops that are integrated into our systems to figure out when we bump up against the uncertainty along the way, we've got the right resources on campus to tap into to help us, uh, to help make informed decisions over time. So I wanna thank the panelists, Miriam, Brent, and Larry for joining us today, and um, for joining us on our journey in this moving forward. Thank you so much. Thank you.